There's an old familiar rhyming couplet that perhaps you are familiar with, and it goes like this. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Now, now this traditional rhyme, it details what a bride should wear at her wedding. She needs to have on her person on the day that she walks down the aisle and says, I do, an item that is old, one that is new, one borrowed, and, and one blue. And there's actually a final line to the rhyme that nobody really pays attention to. I wasn't really aware of it, but for good measure, it really has nothing to do with anything we'll talk about tonight, but we'll just say it anyway. The final line of the poem is, and a sixpence in her shoe, which I would suspect is where we get the tradition of passing around one of, you know, an empty shoe at the reception or at a wedding ceremony to raise a little, uh, you know, pot of money for the happy couple, you know. I, I actually toyed with the idea tonight of asking our ushers to collect the offering in one of their shoes just for the sake of making tonight's message memorable, but I, I passed. You're welcome. Now, I, I uh, in doing all of this, in, in a bride uh, having something old, something new, borrow blue, and, and even the sixpence in the shoe, if, that's, if that suits her fancy, by, by having or wearing all of these items on her wedding day, the bride supposedly invites good luck to be with her and her husband as they embark on the journey of marriage. Some like to believe that each item brings luck to a specific area, and if you follow the rhyme's order, those areas are fertility, the future, their fortunes, fidelity, and finance. That's where the sixpence in the shoe, that's the finance one. But uh, the rhyme, it actually has British roots. It comes from the late 1800s. That's when it's first recorded, at least to our knowledge. And in fact, it has been applied through generations of the royal family, among many others, of course. But even up until modern times, you can see the royals, they'll apply this old, old wives' tale, this old rhyme, uh, in 2011, at the wedding of Prince William and Catherine Middleton, the bride, Kate Middleton, wore something old, Carrickma Cross lace, something new, a pair of diamond earrings given to her by her parents, something borrowed, the halo tiara owned by Queen Elizabeth, and something blue, a small ribbon sewn into the inside of her dress. And you're wondering, why in the world are we talking about this? Now, all of this is uh, interesting English folklore and a little bit of history. It's a quaint, familiar phrase pertaining to weddings, but none of it actually means anything. If, if you believe it does, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. None of it means anything. None of these items actually invite good luck to the happy couple. It is superstition at worst and a fun wedding tradition at best. But I bring this phrase to our attention tonight because I intend to use these four items as a few subjects that the Lord has laid on my heart as we embark on a little series over the next four weeks. I should say the next four times I'm preaching. How many know that the church is the bride of Christ? There, there are far too many scriptures to quote tonight, but the image of the church being the bride, it is found throughout the Bible. Revelation 21 and 2, for example. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, and the new Jerusalem, that holy city, it was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When he saw this site, it wasn't just a physical holy city that he saw, but John would have seen the inhabitants as well. When John had this grand vision, he saw you and I there in the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and he said all of it, the city, the place, the people, all of it was like a bride adorned for her husband. Everyone say, a bride adorned. That will be our series for the next several times I preach in this pulpit. Let me say tonight, it is not uncommon for a bride to try to look uh, her absolute best as she approaches her wedding day. Of course, the bride makes preparations. She gets the right dress. She, she picks out some nice shoes. She's going to get her hair done. She's going to get all primed and primed on the day of her wedding. And, and it's just all part of the process the beautifying of the bride for her groom on her wedding day. And John said, when I saw the holy city, when I saw the inhabitants therein, I saw people that had made some preparations. 
They had adorned themselves for Jesus, the bridegroom, just like a bride would adorn herself for her wedding. They did not approach that day approaching the Lord Jesus casually, John said, but, but I could tell they had made themselves ready. They had adorned themselves like a bride. And so again, we are the bride. Jesus, he is the bridegroom. And our relationship to him is like that of a marriage relationship. And if you are going to fully understand and appreciate this, this symbol, this type, this shadow, and this metaphor, you really have to understand what a traditional Jewish wedding looked like in Jesus' day. Now, in biblical times, if you were to go back 2,000 years and beyond, when a couple would have intentions of marriage, there would soon be a betrothal ceremony. Everyone say betrothal. Now, that, that's maybe a little bit foreign to us. It's similar to our modern engagement. But when, when we become engaged to one another, when, when somebody proposes to his bride-to-be and they enter into that time of engagement, it's not as, as binding as it was back then. When somebody was betrothed in Jesus' day in the Jewish tradition, there was actually a betrothal ceremony at that particular point. It was, it was legal. It was binding. There, was, there were documents that were signed at this point in their relationship. Everyone say it was binding. The bride and the groom, they were considered actually to be married at this point. Again, very different from how we do it today. Uh, although they did not live together from that point forward, neither did they consummate their marriage. And this betrothal ceremony, it is much like our salvation experience. We receive salvation when we are born again, when we obey Acts 2.38. And at that point, we take on the name of Jesus. Amen? At that point, when we, when we obey the gospel and we receive God's free gift of his grace and mercy, we enter into covenant relationship with Jesus even now, despite the fact that we are not yet with him despite the fact that we have not yet gone on to our heavenly home to be forever with our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. So, so after this engagement, we would call it, but after this betrothal ceremony in the Jewish tradition of Jesus' day, there was a betrothal period. And, and this time period, it, it lasted perhaps a year. And this is where the bride and the groom, they were actually separated until the final wedding celebration. So it all started with a betrothal ceremony, but it will end with a wedding celebration. But in between, there is this period of waiting. Now, the groom's responsibility during this time of waiting, this betrothal period, it, it was to go back to his father's house and to prepare a place for he and his bride to live. He would perhaps build an add-on to dad's family home, to where he had grown up and and that was his responsibility. And eventually, this bridegroom, he, he would return for his bride, receive her unto himself, and take her back home to the place that he had prepared. They would start their new life, and it was a beautiful moment of celebration and joy. The celebration was coming, but just not yet. There was a waiting period. And all of this brings context to what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14. It's so powerful. Verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He's, he's talking to us. He's talking to his bride. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And when I come again, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And so this language, it, it, it's all in reference to a traditional Jewish wedding. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And the disciples, they knew exactly what Jesus meant. They, they would have visualized his statements here through the lens of marriage. They got it. And so the groom, he would go make his preparations to receive the bride. And during this time, the bride's responsibility was to wait patiently, to remain faithful to her groom, to keep herself pure, and to prepare herself in her own right for the eventual day that the bridegroom would come back for her. She knew it was going to happen. She anticipated it. She waited for it. And, and this, this picture of this betrothal waiting period when the bride and the bridegroom are separated, we see it throughout Scripture, but 
but one particular place, it's found in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. And, and I won't go through the whole parable. You can read it. It's verses 1 through 13 of Matthew 25. But these, these ten virgins, they, they would have been betrothed, and, and they did not know when the bridegroom would come. They knew roughly what, what the time frame would be, and they knew that he would at some point, but they just didn't know exactly when. They, they generally knew the times and the seasons, but they were not aware of the day nor the hour. And so the responsibility in the parable of these ten virgins was, was to keep their lamps full of oil and, and just be ready. Everyone say, be ready. Their responsibility was just to get ready because someday, very soon, the bridegroom was going to come back for them. And, and for the ones, the five that Jesus called wise in the parable, they did so. They were prepared. Their lamps were full of oil. They, they trimmed the wicks of their lamps. And, and it was at midnight that the bridegroom came. An hour that you wouldn't necessarily expect. An hour that you would think not, but, but that's when he came and the wise virgins went into the bridegroom to the marriage and the Bible says that the door was shut behind them. Again, th this is not, I know we, th we maybe thought that this was when they were getting married. They're already betrothed. They are already in covenant. They've, they've already exchanged the name, you know. It's already done. This is not... This is not the, be, the betrothal ceremony. This is the wedding celebration. This is the final culmination and consummation. And, and it's a party, brothers and sisters. That's what this is talking about. And the Bible says that the door was shut behind them, speaking of the finality of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Once the door was shut, those other five foolish virgins, they came and they began to beat on the door and, and ask and beg that they could be let in. But, but he said, no, depart and be cast into outer darkness. The door was shut. I want to tell you that when the rapture of the church takes place and when the people of God, the bride of Christ, is caught up in the air to meet him and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can I tell you, once that happens, it's all over. Once that event, the next great event on God's calendar, once that takes place, it is done. It is final. It is over. I, I would just say tonight, I, I'm compelled in my spirit to say that now, if there was ever a time that we ought not to be playing games with our relationship with God, today is a day. It's not a good idea. That the, the rapture of the church is, is soon to take place, and Jesus is coming back for his bride. And so it's time to clean house. It's it's time to get our affairs in order, and it's time to get right with the master. It's time to make sure that, that our garments are prepared and that we are keeping ourselves pure because the bridegroom, he is coming. And this marriage mentioned in the parable, this final wedding feast, it was this large party, much celebration, where the bride and the bridegroom were finally united as one, never to be separated again. This is a picture of when we finally step into our eternal reward. And uh, I got to tell you, it's going to be a party when we get there. There's going to be a lot of noise when we get there. There's going to be a lot of joy and jubilation when we get there. And we're going to be standing around the throne for all of eternity with our voices lifted, crying, holy, holy, holy is the lamb that was slain, worthy to receive honor, glory, and praise, and power. It's going to be a party. And, and I, I just... I just have to say that uh, the old song was right. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And I look forward to that day, that final culmination, that spiritual consummation of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we get there, Revelation 19 uses a specific title for the party that we're going to have. You, you read about it. In Revelation 19, 7 through 9, he said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. It's for, for those that make themselves ready for it. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto not just a supper, not just a meal or a feast or a party or a celebration, but John said, what God told me to write, it is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, so this is all the context. One, one of the primary 
metaphors and pictures in the scripture of our relationship with Jesus Christ is that of a marriage. It's, it's bride and groom. It's covenant. It's taking on his name and, and it's celebration. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. So the imagery is everywhere. And as the bride of Christ, those who are in covenant with Jesus and looking for that great and glorious day of his return, we must make sure that we are prepared in the waiting as a bride adorned. The wedding feast is coming. The bridegroom is coming. And as we approach that day, we we need to adorn ourselves with a few things. I would say, not an exhaustive list, but as the Lord has led me, so I present to you something old, you might as well say it with me, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. You guys are really wondering what part four is all about, but anyway. (laughs) Without these things, I would... Submit to us tonight that we will not be prepared. Without these things, we will not fulfill our purpose as the bride in the waiting period. And and without these things, we might very well miss his glorious return. So let's dive in tonight. As the bride of Christ, we must adorn ourselves with something old. Everyone say something old. The year was 1913 when a man named William Stanley, he invented the all steel double wall vacuum bottle and he stuck his name on it. Behold, the Stanley Thermos. First brought to market over a century ago, 110 years plus to be exact. And since its beginning, this thermos has become somewhat of an icon. And it has become a symbol of the working man. Does anybody have a thermos that looks remotely like this in your possession? Anybody? They're probably family heirlooms at this point that are passed down from generation to generation. Now, the company historically has focused their marketing toward those who are in the workforce, those participating in outdoor activities like camping and hiking. In fact, as recently as 2012, the company is on record, Stanley, as stating that its products resonated with individuals like, quote, a 30-year career veteran policeman and, quote, a retired army soldier. And so even in their own mind, their branding was directed to somewhat a, a, a niche market, if you will. You know, the, the working man, the outdoorsman, and, et cetera. Now, now, the main claim to fame of the Stanley Thermos, first of all, is its rugged durability. As you can see, these things have gone through like nuclear war, I think, and they've come out on the other side. But also its ability to keep hot things hot and cold things cold for a long time. The Stanley Thermos, it has seen minor changes to its design over the years, as you can see. But the insulating technology, the guts of it, the, the, the internal components first designed and patented by William Stanley in 1913, those have essentially remained the same since the beginning. Now, perhaps the most significant design update to Stanley's line of drinking vessels came in 2016. When the company took their steel double wall design and they gave it a slightly different shape, They added some fresh colors, and voila, the Stanley Quencher was born. Now, I had to run down two soccer moms with lattes in their hands to get my hands on this. That's not true. I'm just joking. I ordered it on Amazon. Came to my door two days later. But they're quite quite the item, the hot ticket item, quite the rave. At least they were as recently as last year, still are in in large part, I believe. But this product, the the quencher, the the new and improved, the updated version of the Stanley Thermos, it boasts a prominent handle. Ooh, ah. It has the ability to maintain a drink's temperature for up to 11 hours, they claim. And, And perhaps most notably, the fact that it fits inside of most car cup holders. (laughs) <laughs> we're going to give this away tonight at the end of the message uh, to me. It's going home with me, actually. So, <laughs> But at its core, it's the, sta- the same Stanley insulating thermos. Perhaps you have noticed these Stanley quencher mugs have ridden a wave of popularity in recent months, and if you haven't, no big deal. I'll tell you about it. They have become... All the rave, as I've said, and the story behind their success is, is interesting to me because the, the quencher, it, it actually didn't initially take off. 
It was around a year later in 2017 that there were three women with a blog called The Buy Guide. And these three women on their blog highlighted the product saying, and I quote, of all the insulated cups, this is the one, just trust. They really loved the product. In fact, there was one of the three, kind of the ringleader that first adopted it, gave it as a gift to the other two. They all loved it. And then they made this post on their blog, just trust. And uh, they passionately shared their feelings with all of their followers. And the interesting thing to me is that these women didn't even work for Stanley. They, they were outsiders, but, but they single-handedly helped to extend the reach of Stanley's brand to places where Stanley wasn't even thinking about. Stanley hadn't even considered the places that their product was about to go. They were still thinking that they were the brand of the working man. They, they were still thinking they were the brand of the outdoorsman. We have our niche, we have our lane, and we're okay to stay in it. Things are fine the way they are. But Stanley was about to tap into the 25 to 50-year-old female consumer market. And man, were they about to be floored by the results. Because here's the thing. Women not only will buy things for themselves, but they buy things for their families. And they buy things for their working husbands on their job. So things were about to take off. And take off they did. After this initial post... The followers of this blog, they started buying them up faster than Stanley was manufacturing them. It's interesting to me that Stanley's vision was too small for the demand that was coming. It got to the point where the buy guide, they, they had to put their money where their mouth was because they had championed the product and the company had run out and, and they weren't really willing to make these huge runs. And so Stanley told them, if you want some, you've got to place a special order for no less than 10,000 quencher mugs. And so there was a big risk involved, and, but they decided to go forward with it, and they bought 10,000 quencher mugs. The first 5,000 lot sold out in four days. The next 5,000 lot sold out in one hour. And after this, it became viral. Somebody just got blessed right over there. Praise God. <laughs> Everyone say Viral. On one social media platform, in fact, TikTok, the hashtag Stanley Tumblr, has been viewed over 700 million times at the time when, when this article that I referenced was written. The consumer base became the biggest promoter after these three women in this blog and the sales they skyrocketed. And the quencher has driven Stanley's overall annual sales from $73 million in 2019 to $750 million in 2023. A cup. It's just a cup, I'm sorry to say, if you really like them. One product, the Stanley Quencher Tumblr Mug, more than 10 times their sales in just three or four years. And I found this story fascinating because nothing really has changed about the Stanley Mug in the past century. Fundamentally, the, the technology is pretty much identical, it's old. It goes back to 1913, and yeah, sure, they, they've changed the shape, and they've put a nice prominent handle on it, and there's a little bit of rubber involved and, and all that kind of stuff. They've added some fresh pastel colors, but, but at the end of the day, it's just a really well-built, steel-insulated cup from the early 1900s. The product that they have had from the beginning is a great product. It's always been a great product. The problem with Stanley is that they were content to just cater to their niche. And, and they didn't seem to care about putting their product in front of a new audience. Maybe they just thought, well, it probably wouldn't appeal to them. We're the working man brand. One of the three women from the blog, they actually said this, and I quote, Stanley had been a company only producing occasional use items. They were making items for people's camping trips. You don't do that every day for their tailgating parties. And we told them, we, we said, this cup is a daily use item. Th this product you're, you're, you're selling, it is an everyday, all day item. And to Stanley's credit, they have leaned into this brand shift, embracing new marketing techniques, and they have ridden the wave of success, all with a really old product. They didn't need something new. 
They just needed to take something old that they already had. And with a fresh excitement, with some fresh passion, in this case from somebody from the outside, they just happened to come across it and loved it. Their job was to share it with the world again. Share it with the world again. Somebody say, something old. Tonight I want to talk to us about something old that we have in our possession as the apostolic church, and that is the message that we preach. The message we preach is not a new message. It's an old message. It's a very old message, but it's still a relevant message. It is not a niche message for a select few, but it is a message with broad appeal for whosoever will. Let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the cross of Calvary. It goes back not 100 years, but but 2,000 years when the God of all glory robed himself in a human body and he lived a sinless life. He showed us what God's kingdom looked like. He healed the sick. Jesus restored the broken. He befriended sinners. And everywhere he went, Jesus, he served others. He was the king of all kings. He was the Lord of all lords in a body of flesh. But he didn't come with pomp and circumstance asking everybody else to to bow down before him and make a big time. No, he served everybody else. It It was an upside down. It is an upside down kingdom in the kingdom of God. And one day, this man, Jesus, he went to a criminal's cross where he died a gruesome death, shedding his innocent blood. But this was all in his plan. For it is that spotless sacrifice that has made a way for all the world to be saved. It's an old story. But it's it's still a story worth telling. It's an old story, but it's a story that still has the power to bind up the broken and It's a story that still has the power to deliver the addicted and to heal the hurting, to save the sinner, and to redeem the lost. The good news of Jesus, this story that we tell, this message that we preach, the good news is that he took your place, that he paid your price for your sin so that you don't have to pay it yourself. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That is the message that we preach. It's the only message that can redeem and save. It's the only story worth telling. It's Jesus' story. It's his life. It's his death. It's his resurrection and his soon coming return. I've just come to go on record tonight and say we don't need a new message. I understand it's an old message, but it doesn't need changing because the foundation is firm and the structure is sound. And and I want to say that the core components of this message, they are still good, they are still right, and they don't need altering. Amen. The core components are there And so I would say, like I said for Stanley, the company, what we need is to take something old and with a fresh excitement, some fresh passion, share it with the world again. Lord, help us to not be content to just take what we have and cater to our niche until Jesus comes. But Lord, help us to have a passion to put this message, to put this story in front of new audiences and Lord, I pray that you'd help us to lift our eyes to the harvest, for they are white and they are ready to harvest. And God, help us to understand that this message of salvation, it is to be preached in all the world and it is to be preached to every creature, not a select few, not a niche, not a lane, but everybody. The message of salvation, I will hasten tonight. It's an old message. But we preach the same thing that has been preached from the beginning. It goes all the way back to the first day of church history. It's the first sermon ever preached, first altar call ever given. Peter was the preacher that day on the day of Pentecost. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. But the question was finally asked, what shall we do? How are we saved? And the answer to the question, it has not changed in 2,000 years. If Peter said this that day, 
I will tell us tonight that if Peter were standing in the pulpit tonight, he would say the same thing that he said then. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or for the washing away of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter preached the message. Peter gave the answer. And it's the same today. If you want to get right with God, all you've got to do is repent. Turn to God in repentance. Be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. And the promise is that you shall receive the gift of God's Spirit. And he would go on to say that this promise is not just unto you. That was his immediate audience. But it's unto your children and to all that are afar off. That's you and me. And so we just preach the same message that Peter preached. We, we practice and implement the same gospel that the apostles practiced and implemented. And, and you know, the, the truth is, Peter didn't just make this up on the spot. It wasn't something that came from a committee. But this is what Jesus had told his disciples to preach in all the world. And just like Peter and all of the apostles preached it, we still preach it. Just like Jesus said, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. We still preach that same message. That you've got to turn to him and, and be baptized and, and receive his spirit. I understand today that there are some that are interested in preaching a different message. I understand today that there are those that are content to preach another gospel. But Paul had some strong words to say about people like that. Here's the deal. I'm not trying to come up with something new in the 21st century. I'm adorning myself with something old. I'm going back to the original. I'm going back to the first century. I'm going back to how Jesus told them to preach it, how they did preach it, and how they lived it. There's only one way to be saved. We talk like this sometimes because there's one continuous warning that we see repeatedly in Scripture, and that is a warning against false teaching. It's a warning that is especially directed toward the end time church, people like you and I living in the last of the last days. Paul said to Timothy that people in the end times would not endure sound doctrine. He said that they would have a form of godliness, but there would be no real power there from such turn away. He said, Paul said, that some will depart from the faith, that some will believe doctrines of devils. He warned us that people would be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Peter also, he said that there would be false teachers that preach damnable heresies. He's not talking about people outside of the church. He's talking about people in the last days within, with, uh, underneath the banner of Christendom that would preach damnable heresies, which is just a fancy way of saying doctrines that will send you to hell. Damnable heresies. Jude sounded the alarm that the church would should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We don't need it to be delivered several other times throughout church history. It was delivered once to the saints, and we should contend for that faith delivered. And even Jesus warned us, as he was telling his disciples about the signs of the times, take heed that no man deceive you. So God's word lets us know that there are going to be lots of doctrines floating around in the end times. Lots of new ideas. Lots of new flavors of Christianity, if you will. Lots of, lots of new, lots, lots of new stuff, but, but I'm reaching for the old today. I'm adorning myself as the bride of Christ with something old. And I know when you talk this way, and when you, when you address the absolutes in the word of God, it, it sometimes feels like you're trying to pick a fight with people. And I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody. I'm not trying to stand up here tonight and, and say that, well, we're right and everybody else is wrong. That's not my heart. That's not my intention. But I am saying, let God be true. Let his word be true. And every man a liar, if it be me or anybody, if we don't align with this book, then we are not right. Because it's only the word of God that we will be judged by in eternity. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not the preacher on YouTube. It's the word of God that we are judged by. So let's be sure to reach way back and get a hold of an old message because it still works. It still gets the job done. And furthermore, I would say the world is waiting. The world wants it. 
Prophet Jeremiah, music can join me. Pastor quoted this verse a few weeks ago. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? It's the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. But despite whoever chooses to not walk therein, as for me and my house, as for me as, and, and the leaders of this local assembly and this house, as for us, we, we're just here to say we're going to walk in the old paths. We're reaching, we're asking, we're seeking it. Solomon said in Proverbs twenty two twenty eight, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. It's an old landmark. It's an old truth. It's an old story. It's an old message that has been passed to us, but but we're not in the business of moving it and changing it and just trying to make it new for the sake of making it new. We don't need to make it new. We need to take it as it is. It's an old truth. As we try to reach our world, we will certainly try new tactics and new methods and everyone say amen. Nothing wrong with new tactics and there's nothing wrong with new methods and we will talk about that a little bit next week or next time. Not next Sunday. We will give our efforts an update every once in a while. That's good. Changing our approach in preaching the gospel message, that's a good thing in an ever-changing world. Can I get an amen? I'm not saying change the message. The message stays the same, but we change our approach. We change our methods, not the message. But one thing that we have just resolved, it's in the DNA of this assembly, to never change, is our commitment to preach that same gospel message that the apostles preached. I want to leave you with one final thought here tonight. Prophet Isaiah, in chapter 61, verse 10, he makes this interesting statement that we'll kind of launch into one final thought here, but the prophet said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Why? For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. This, this message of salvation, it's likened by the prophet, not just the message, but the experience of it. It is likened to a garment by the prophet Isaiah. He said that God hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. I love it. Ties right in. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. The, the message of salvation, it's something that we can adorn ourselves with, rather that the Lord adorns us with. We adorn ourselves with the experience. We adorn ourselves with the message itself, taking it to a hungry, hurting world. This salvation message it is like a garment that clothes us. And when we first come out of the world, God covers us with this garment. And the prophet said, it's just like a bride. Just, just like that betrothal ceremony. When we first come into covenant with the bridegroom, we are given a garment of salvation. Go with me for a moment all the way back to the book of Exodus in your Bible. Story of the Israelites. They, they had been in Egypt as slaves for centuries, some 400 years. Their burdens were heavy, their taskmasters cruel, but, but all of that changed quickly. In just a moment, when God decided to step in and turn it around. He delivered his people, and we're familiar with the story perhaps. He calls Moses out of Midian and speaks to him from a burning bush. Go back to Pharaoh, walk into Egypt and say, let my people go. With ten plagues and, and, and with a parting Red Sea and dry ground and swallowing up an Egyptian army, God did the work. It's a story we're familiar with. But you know, from Egypt, they headed toward Canaan. They're free now. They're going toward their promised land, but it would not be an easy journey. There was a wilderness wandering period of, of time that would last 40 years. And our story is a lot like theirs. Because we too have been delivered out of this world. And we are on our way to our eternal promised land called heaven. 
but we find ourselves in between those two bookends. We, we are here in the wilderness of this world, in the waiting period, in the betrothal period, if you will. But I want you to remember one detail about the Israelites' departure from Egypt. It was a quick departure. They didn't really have time to pack everything up. In fact, God said, don't even make leavened bread because we can't even wait around for that. They had the clothes on their backs and they had the shoes on their feet and really not much more. We also know that on the way out of Egypt, the Bible says that they spoiled the Egyptians and they received different things, but including raiment, clothing. So they didn't have much, but, but evidently God made sure that they were outfitted with the necessary garment for their journey. And the most amazing detail is given to us about the garments, that the clothes, the clothes that the Israelites wore. Deuteronomy 8 and 4 Moses was reminiscing about it at the end of the wilderness wandering. They're about to enter into the promised land and, and Moses said, don't forget thy raiment waxed not old upon thee. Neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Moses, he was reminding them that what God had clothed them with at the beginning, it never wore out. They, they never outgrew any of it. It's not in the scripture, it's conjecture and speculation, but some even believe that the children that would have come out of Egypt at the beginning, that those clothes would have grown with them, that their shoes would have grown with them. I don't know for sure, but it does say that their foots did not swell. So maybe that's very much true. It, it certainly was a miraculous provision from God. It lasted the entire journey, all the way from Egypt, all the way to Canaan. And, and we just kind of read over that, like we gloss over the detail, but that's amazing. You know, I'm only 32. You know, I'm, I'm not quite to 40. They were there for 40 years in the wilderness in, in adverse conditions, and they've got one set of clothing on their back, perhaps just one cloak more. The Bible says that it never wore out. We, we get rid of clothes like they're going out of style because I guess they literally are going out of style. Just this week, I was cleaning up my closet, and I was grieved in my spirit because there was a pair of jeans I really liked, and... It was like two years ago. They started going threadbare in the knee, and I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I folded them. I put them back in the closet. Haven't worn them since, but I threw them out. Our clothes wear out. It doesn't take all that long, but not the Israelites. The Israelites wore the same garments for 40 years, and God miraculously sustained those garments until the day they stepped into their promise. I know the garment is old, Moses said, but it doesn't look old. It is an old garment, but it hasn't waxed old upon thee. It's remained just as pristine through the entire wilderness wandering as the day you left Egypt. The Israelites didn't need to change their garments as they wandered through the wilderness on their way to their promised land. They were covered with an old garment, but the old garment went the distance. The old garment, it went with them all the way. It covered them all the way to Canaan land. And I would say to us that when we left Egypt, God clothed us, like the prophet said, with garments of salvation. He made sure that we had everything we would need for the journey through the wilderness of this world. And I want you to know that the garment of salvation will carry you on into glory land. This, this garment of salvation, it will take you all the way to heaven. It's an old salvation garment prepared at Calvary, given to us when we were born again, betrothed to Jesus. But it has not waxed old. It has not worn out yet. I know that there are voices and there are people that would like to lift their voice and say it's an irrelevant message. It's an irrelevant garment. It's an irrelevant experience. It's not for today. Can we just tone it down? Can we just uh, dumb it down? But I'm just here to say that the old garment looks just fine. Thank you very much. And I am very well pleased to wear it and to keep it and to go all the way with it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are not looking for a new covering. We don't need a new covering. The Acts 238 message isn't thread barren. It's not fraying at the seams. We haven't worn holes in the knees of its message. It's just as sturdy today as it ever was. And the church said amen. Stand together with me. It's an old message. 
but with a fresh burden and with fresh passion, God would call us to share it with the world again. Again, the people of God, bride of Christ, don't forget to adorn yourself with something old. It's an old rugged cross. It's redeeming blood that flowed a long time ago. It's a 2,000-year-old story. Yes, absolutely. But let me tell us, it is that blood that cleanses and covers us, and it has not worn out. It has not lost its power. It still reaches to the highest mountain. It still flows to the lowest valley. The cross, the gospel, it is just the same today. It is just as relevant and powerful today as it ever has been. Something old. Can we lift our hands here tonight? I feel the compulsion, the the commission of the Spirit of God here tonight. I wonder if you can just lift your voice with your hands and just give into that for a moment and just... And just say, Lord, let that fresh burden, let that fresh passion for an old message. God, I pray that you'd let a new burden for an old message rest upon me tonight. We have what this world needs. We have what this world needs. I wonder if you would just help me lead your row, lead those around you. Just lift your voice. As if you were leading this congregation in prayer. Can you just pray in the Holy Ghost? Pray in the understanding. Whatever you feel to do, but just pray, church. Just keep praying. What a shame, what a travesty it would be in the last of the last days for a people to lay off that old garment with intention to put on something new that, that really has no, no relevance, that, that will go threadbare really fast. God would call us to stand firm on the faith once delivered. God would call us in this end time hour to not waver and to not waffle on what we have been declaring for some 62 years here in Marysville at Capital Community Church. Now is not the time to turn away from the message of salvation. Now is not the time to water down Acts 2.38. So take hold of it, bride of Christ. Adorn yourself with salvation. Adorn yourself with the message. If you would like to make a commitment before God tonight, why don't we step out of our seats, come around an altar, and say, God, I'm committed to an old message tonight. I'm committing my life, my voice, my future to an old message that needs to be declared to a world in need.